Hey, it's Jared from Latigo Life, and this week I did an interview with a guy named uh, Raymond Diaz, and they downsized their house from a 3,000 square foot house to a 36 foot RV. They've been traveling for about four years now. They've got four kids, and they are just really, really inspirational. Um, their story was incredible, and I really think that you're going to get a lot out of this, not only from a downsizing thing, but from a mission standpoint. Uh, they are living life with a mission. And uh, I really think that you'll enjoy this interview. All right, everyone, I'm on with Raymond Diaz this morning. And this guy is really cool. He's, um, I've been following him on Instagram, on Instagram for a while. And they have an account called Walking by Faith Missions. And I just really think that their idea of doing mission work on the road while traveling um, is just really appealing to me. And so I thought I'd bring him on and talk about some of the downsizing they had to do, talk about kind of their plans for what they're doing with their family. So appreciate you being on, man. Thank you, brother. So can you give me kind of uh, the background of your story, like how you got started, how you decided you were going to do this RV thing? Well, to be honest, it was kind of forced upon us. Um, I was an active duty Marine Staff Sergeant, I and I, uh, as an inspector instructor down in Austin, Texas. So we were doing all the funeral details and, and whatnot, and I was a logistics chief for a weapons company down there. And we bought our dream house. We moved from Okinawa, Japan to Texas. We put all of our money down into this house, and within a couple months, I had my third reconstructed shoulder surgery. A month later, I had kidney failure and almost died. And then four months later, I was out medically from the Marine Corps. Oh, geez. So, yeah, so we just sunk all of our money into this dream house. We were making $5,000 a month, and I went from making that to only $1,800 a month. Wow. So, yes. So we bought our RV as for recreational purposes, and at the end, it turned out being a saving grace. Yeah. So what happened was we tried to hold on to the house as long as possible. We took out loans. We did everything because we were told that the VA was going to fix our paperwork, and it took four years for them to fix our paperwork. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, but um, it turned out being a blessing. My wife and I were looking at Instagram and on the internet, and we kept seeing how so many families were just downsizing and just traveling full-time and RVing. And I told her, you know, with, with the income that we're having, I think we can do this. You know, me and my wife were talking about it. And one thing led to another. We did a short sale in the house. Mm -hmm. We downsized a 3,000-square-foot house to a 36-foot RV. Nice with four children and two Yorkies. So we did it, you know. I, I, there was a lot of people that told us we're crazy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I honestly believe it brought my family together because being a Marine, I was always gone all the time. You know, my last three years in Japan with my family, I barely saw them for nine months and three years. And when we came back, you know, I had my surgery. And then when all of this started happening, my wife got diagnosed with lupus and fibromyalgia. So she was bedridden, and for three months she couldn't walk. I had to help her to the restroom and everything. And I really think the Lord was letting me know that I wasn't where I needed to be because I thought I was a good husband, I thought I was a good father, and I wasn't. I I didn't know what my kids liked. I didn't even know how they learned. I didn't know nothing. And here I was pushed to homeschool them, and then I thought I knew my wife, and then she went through so many struggles herself, and. It really was a gut check, to be honest. I, my perspectives weren't where my priorities weren't where they needed to be. Yeah, that's. I mean, I can totally understand the. I mean, you guys have gone way, way smaller than what we did. I mean, people say we were crazy for doing. You know, ours was basically half the size. Um, but getting rid of half of your stuff is difficult, and so I can't imagine getting rid of what ninety percent of it. Probably. I mean, to. I mean, at least. I mean. So that's crazy. Um, I mean, it's really cool, and it definitely is a testament to, like, when we end up in those hard positions that, you know, that's where we learn the most because there's no reason to change if you're comfortable and you're all just, everything's peachy, you know. So it's really interesting. So <clears throat> how long ago was that? That was almost four years ago. Four years ago. That's crazy. So you guys do now, you travel around. I mean, some people think, oh, we just travel around and just hang out and do all kinds of stuff. But you guys have a mission, right? So, like, talk about that a little bit. Well, 
the Lord put it in our hearts about two years ago. He told us the gospel is free and so are we. So we wanted to start a small free ministry called Walking by Faith Missions. Um, so we established a mission. You know, everyone has a different gifting. Some people are called to preach, some are to teach, and some are, are seed planters. And that's what me and my family are. Um, we basically live out the way we're supposed to live out, and we just help the communities we're a part of. We've done everything from helping old fallen down churches that are historic rebuilding those churches to helping out youth ministries up in montana um with the flathead and kootenai reservation and we just go where the lord guides us um a lot of our ministries just love to be honest um a lot of people they have a bad perspective on christianity because our culture basically you know a lot of the churches started judging people and oh you're not you're not good enough or you're not this and you know, we just want people to know that, you know what, that's not Christ-like. Right. You know, we're not supposed to judge. We're supposed to love one another. We're supposed to serve the community and serve each other. You know, it's called servanthood evangelism. That's what we do. And that's what we do. We we help people. And if it gives us an opportunity to minister, and they normally ask, you know, what brought you to this? You know, they want my testimony or something like that. Mm -hmm. Then I minister to them, you know. I think living out being Christ-like is a lot better than just preaching it. Oh, definitely. <clears throat> Absolutely. So you guys are in Florida. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm gonna, I have a friend of mine that I've talked to that lives down there, uh, Gates of Hope. Have you come across him at all? Oh, no. Okay, you, might, you need to check him out. I'm going to plug him here because he's really cool. Um, he does, like, he works with people like you guys that are in RVs and stuff, and, like, he has these teams that go out. He calls them go teams, and they go out, and they do different types of ministries. Maybe they're setting up a church or doing the type of thing you're talking about, servant uh, servant ministries. And it, his, his whole church is based online out of his house. Um, so he does all of his stuff, you know, from YouTube and Facebook or whatever. But it's called Gates of Hope, so you might check him out. Um, I, I can put you guys in contact with him because they are doing some really cool stuff there, too. So... That's really neat. I would like to get a hold of that. Yeah, and he's in Florida, so you're probably not that far from him. I mean, I know Florida's a big state. It's like, hey, they're in Texas, and they're six hours from you, <laughs> you know, but still. <clears throat> um, yeah, that's just, uh, I, I really, um, I like the idea of having a mission, you know, instead of just, we're just going to travel around and chill out and, you know, give our kids, let our kids experience, you know, experience the world around them, which is a great thing, but having that deeper mission of okay the reason we're doing this is because you know we're showing love and that's really the you know the end all be all of it you know and I think that's the message that people miss a lot in the gospel is that it's a gospel of love and it's not a gospel of condemnation or anything like that so um so tell me a little bit about the process of downsizing you obviously had a 3,000 square foot house so where did you start with that Okay, what we did was at first we got a pod storage and we had a, accumulated a lot of furniture and a lot of um, memories from Japan because we spent five years in Japan. So, you know, all the Japanese Komodos and all of my Marine Corps uniforms and things like that went into the pod. And we tried to sell a couple things. We did a Craigslist to sell a couple of, like furniture that we weren't going to keep and whatnot. And the rest of it, uh, we donated to Goodwill. So wow. we just kept what we needed and whatever wasn't a necessity to keep, like memory-wise, family pictures and stuff like that, we just donated. Right. So how long did it take you to do that process? I mean, it took us probably at least at least a good year to downsize to what you know we knew that thought we needed or whatever. And, of course, we've gotten rid of more stuff since then. But when you sort of first start that, you're like, oh, I need this and this and this. And then you realize, I don't need any of that, you know. So how long did it take you to do that? It took us about two or three months, to be honest. And you we're actually downsizing again, yeah. which is really funny. Yeah. Well, we, we got a small air uh, climate controlled storage unit. Just over the years traveling, you know, we go to all the state parks, all the national parks, all the museums in the area as a part of our homeschool curriculum with the children. Mm -hmm. um, we're very hands on with our education with our kids. And you know, they get little gadgets here and there, little toy booklets and whatnot, and over the years it's accumulated. So yep. we're we're downsizing some more. Yeah. 
My wife's in the background. Yeah. Is she, is she feeding you lines? <laughs> she's reminding me. Yeah. My memory's not as good as hers, but she's very shy when it comes to like video stuff. I got you. I tried to get her on here. She wouldn't come on though. I, I tried. <laughs> My wife is the same way. She's like, you know what? If you want to do that stuff, go for it. But I'm not <laughs> doing that. So that's, it's interesting that uh, we even have like a channel at all because the reason she started it was because she has social anxiety real bad. And so she was like, I'm going to start making these videos literally in her closet and just has them like they're not pro they're not published or anything and it's just her like talking and so like over time she's like maybe I'll publish something you know and so she started doing these day in the life videos and then it just kind of spiraled from there so she would never have done the one that we had uh, for the for the about our house and go downsize and that sort of thing she never would have done that if she would known the exposure that it was gonna give us and uh, and that was just I feel like that was really the Lord saying hey um, you know, you guys have got a story to share. And that's, just, that's the reason I reached out to you is because, I, of course, I didn't know your whole story, but I could tell there was something there, you know. And, uh, and you just kind of, people come into your life and you realize, hey, um, this is the direction I need to be going, you know. So it's just neat. <clears throat> All right, so you guys are in a 36-foot trailer right now? Yes, sir. Okay, of it's course, a 36 you're, in, so you're in your mother-in-law's house right now, right? Yes, to use the internet. Yeah, yeah, to use the internet. Okay. So you guys are in the trailer. Um, this has been about a four-year process. Um, so where do you go from here? What's the next thing that you guys are doing? Well, to be honest, we were looking into getting a small um, home to just get all of our stuff out of storage. But then my wife and I continued praying, and we feel like the Lord wants us to travel for another year here in the States. So we decided to do that. That's why we're downsizing a little bit more. Um, I have a year left to finish graduate school. Uh, I'm working on my master's in religion. Okay. And as soon as I graduate from there, my wife and I are wanting to go overseas and just go backpacking and doing mission work through Europe and Asia. That's awesome. Um, so what are you downsizing to then? Smaller trailer? No, we're just downsizing um, clothes and all okay. the stuff that we've got over the, over the couple years. We, it's really crazy. You can cram a lot of stuff into an RV. We had about... 15 bins of storage stuff. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah, my wife had about four shoes. <laughs> <laughs> She'll appreciate you saying that. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, wow, yeah, I guess I didn't realize how much stuff you can put in there. I mean, so my wife and I are considering that as well. Obviously, you know, we're not going to have a 36-foot, you know, we're not going to live in it full-time, but we'd like, we would like to do some traveling. And... Um, you know, of course, we'll see where that goes, I guess. You can't say, well, I'm never going to do this because you don't know where you're going to go. You don't know where you're going to end up. So, I mean, you probably didn't think you'd ever end up living in an RV with your four kids, you know, no, five, sir, six years I ago. Never, <laughs> I would have never thought that, man. I was always on the go. I was always traveling. I just, you know, I lived a life where, you know, military members don't make a lot of money. But when you're I and I, you get extra money. And, you know, whatever we wanted, we bought. And I bought my family the best of everything, you know, I bought my wife a charger, paid it cash, did all that stuff. And when we had to lose everything, it really made me think, you know, my wife too, we talk about it all the time, how a lot of times you don't understand how materialistic you are until you have to get rid of stuff. And then you're like, man, I had all of this stuff, but it really didn't bring me happiness. Yeah. You know, we, we were struggling a lot of things, you know, I was struggling with my parenting, I was struggling with our marriage, there was a lot of stuff going on behind the curtains that we were hiding with beautiful things, you know, we had nice cars, we had a beautiful house, and it wasn't until we downsized that we had to come to terms with what's really going on, and um, Tiny Living has done wonder, wonders for my marriage, my parenting, you know, before my kids didn't want nothing to do with me because I was, I, they, they said I treated them like recruits. Um, I wasn't an, I, I was a disciplinary in the Marine Corps, so whenever someone got in trouble, they sent them to Staff Sergeant Diaz, and I would yell at them and, you know, do what I needed to do to correct them right. so they would fix themselves, but that aggressiveness kind of didn't stop. It was built into me, yeah. so, you know, something so simple, like, they would break something back, and I, I would get onto them more than what I should, Right. and, you know, it took having it to really humble myself to understand, you know, my kids are not my Marines, right. you know, my wife is not my Marines, stuff like that. And it just really helped me grow. You know, my wife always tells me all the time, whenever I, I get upset or something, she's like, Ramon, 
humble. And that she just, that's my reminder, stay humble. So, if, you know, if something were to get me upset, I, I stay, you know, helps me. Humility really is something we should all be practicing and it's easier said than done. It definitely is, that's for sure. <clears throat> that's one of the things that I um, have struggled with over the years is humility. And so my wife will do the same thing to me. She's like, you know, maybe tone it back a little bit, scale, you know, scale it down. And I'm just like, okay. <laughs> You know they're they're very good at keeping us in check. That's for sure. So, um, okay. So, you guys uh, obviously your income went way down. So that's one of the questions that um, I know people and you know that travel around get a lot. So, income wise, uh, how do you do this? You know, making money that sort of thing on the go. I mean, what's what's your what's your secret there? You know. I really don't have a secret. Just um, we live humbly and frugally within my retirement from the Marine Corps. So, you know, our first year of RVing, we were getting used to everything. So we started park hosting in state parks. We did that for our first year of RVing. Um, state and national parks have these programs where if you stay for a month or two months, mm -hmm. you volunteer like 20 hours a week. You stay for free. Wow. So that helped out a lot when we were first transitioning into living in an RV because our first year we were in the process of selling our house mm -hmm. and towards the end of that year you know we decided to just do a short sale because it was uh, being burdensome and after that we started to venture out um, my wife she holds a tight budget we normally don't stay in an RV park it's more than five or five fifty a month we try to keep it around yeah but we try to keep it around three fifty our max is five hundred five fifty um, and that's all utilities paid mm. Um, my wife, she wants to write a little travel guidebook because all the RV parks we've been to because my wife, what she does is we, to save money, we travel from state to state to state. We don't hop two or three states over. So if we're in Florida, next month we'll be in Georgia and then the next month we'll travel to so on and so forth. Um, that helps save a lot of money. If you stay in RV parks, RV resorts, if you stay for a month, it's cheaper than st spending a week or two there. Um, a lot of times it's cheaper to stay a month than it is to stay two weeks. So we'll stay a month at a location. Um, all utilities are paid. Most places have, you know, washers, dryers, pools, jacuzzis, playground for kids. And you really can't beat it. Um, Wi-Fi, cable, all for $350 to $500 a month. Um, groceries, we normally buy our groceries weekly. Um, we do that to, that way we don't, buy things that we don't need we just okay we're eating this is our recipes for the week this is what we need to buy this is what we need for snacks and those things really help save a lot of money yeah my, uh, my wife says if we're gonna travel and we're gonna jump to a couple states over we budget a little bit better and we save more that month so you know let's say we go to eat out two or three times in a month We'll cut it to one time, and all of those little things, um, we'll plan for months just to skip a couple states over. A perfect example, um, we we left from Montana to Amarillo, Texas. We're in northern Montana, um, up there helping out um, the Salish and Kootenai tribes, and we came all the way to Amarillo, from Amarillo all the way to Florida, but we had that planned out six, seven months in advance. So for months, we put the money aside for gas and for having to pull over. And, you know, when, whenever we're in between travels, instead of staying at an RV park in, in between travels, we stay at like Love's and, and uh, Flying J gas stations. Yeah. Um, a lot of them have sewage, water. Some of them even have like electricity for 10 bucks a night. Um, so you can hook up your RV to electricity for 10 bucks a night so you can run your air conditioning and stuff like that. Um, there's a lot of ways to to save money. It's just you have to do the research. And there's days where my wife would spend countless nights just planning out the entire year. And she literally says, "Okay, these are all the destinations we want to go to." She maps out the route that we're gonna go. She looks at all the gas stations that we can stay at. She looks at the RV parks in between. She looks at the museums, the state and national parks. Like if my wife wanted to work for the FBI, she'd be <laughs> wonderful. That's awesome. That's a, <clears throat> I mean, I guess if you're going to do it, that's the way to do it. You know, that makes sense. I didn't realize that um, like truck uh, truck stops and stuff had sewage and electric and stuff for RVs. 
uh, never paid attention to it. Never had an RV, so totally makes sense. A lot of people, they'll stay at flight. Um, perfect example, the Yellowstone. If you want to stay at Yellowstone, a lot of the RV parks around the area is ridiculously expensive. But there's an amazing Flying J, and it's like $15 a night. And you can park your RV there for four days. It's a max of four days, so it's 15 bucks a night with electricity. Flying J. That's what I'm Flying J. So it, it's really not that expensive. You know, you just wow. you have to plan and research. You know, a lot of people they Flying ask J us. They're becoming more altered to truckers and RVs. My wife is saying that Flying Js are more tailored towards uh, truckers and RVs now, which they are. Yeah, I have RV. She can come over here in the view if she wants. <laughs> she just won't come. She'll say hi. Come on. It's not even live. It's just recording. Hey, how are you? Good. Good to see you. Nice to see you. So, so you do all the planning stuff. So you're the brains behind the operation. So see, we need to know this. <laughs> so do you enjoy being on the road as much as he does? More. More so? Right. I have to talk him into it about every six months or so. He's ready to get a house. <laughs> I love I love traveling. Yeah. I just I really want a small house, like a tiny house, okay. and some acreage so I have a place to go hunting and fishing. That's wow. pretty much what it is. Um, originally, I told my wife many moons ago that I want to buy like 20, 30 acres of land and build like three or four tiny houses on the property. So our friends and family can come visit us or let's say we're traveling doing mission work, you know, they want to stay at a place they can have their own little tiny house on the property and that's kind of like what I want to do. It's not like I don't, I don't want to give up traveling because obviously we want to go, we're I called to go that. overseas. Right. I don't believe <laughs> I that. That's awesome. <clears throat> no, that's a great plan. That's, you know, so we, we live on uh, our the in-laws land that um, we built on is actually four acres, but there's around us, there's, I think there's like probably 15 to 20 acres around us and there's only two other houses on it. So it's not like we're right next, up next to somebody. Um, <clears throat> so like I told Rachel, you know, like, hey, we should totally like, if we like the traveling thing, we should totally like Airbnb our house for a little while and go travel. That way we're getting some income off of the house, you know. And my in-laws are right next door, and she loves people anyway. She could totally take care of it, you know, while they're, <laughs> and we'll just, you know, work something out where we're paying her part of it or whatever, you know. But it's a, uh, I would really like to be able to do that and be able to have a home base, you know, but still be able to go travel and do that kind of stuff. It's a home base. We've had several instances, especially this last year, the RV tire exploded. That was a real faith moment. It mm -hmm. ripped our feet apart. Um, where we were supposed to be making our way completely through Utah up into Idaho, we were stuck in a very, ex right outside of Zion. So it's really expensive, not in budget. Right. And we just didn't have a home base, something to fall back on. If something happens to the RV, we have nothing. Yeah. That's a lot of where he is, I think, that just having that home base where I think I could go forever and not ever have a house. <laughs> Love it. But uh, I don't know. I think once you start, if you embrace it, I experience a lot of people who don't. They like the amenities of a house and right. having that. Where my heart, I love the people we meet. Uh, that We touch people just as much as they touch us. Mm -hmm. The people that come into our lives, sometimes it you're having a conversation and your hair raises on your body because you know like this is not by chance there's a point when things happen that you know this is not a chance encounter here right every single step especially this last year this last year I knew something and I still I can't tell you what but I can tell you something's gonna happen this year it's big because it's been leading up to it over the last four years, but this last year was a really test of faith that, I don't know, it's, it's a relationship with God, a relationship with our family, uh, in the RV, living the way that we do. Um, since the VA just fixed the stuff, we're able to get a cabin now, or a tiny house or whatever, and we're going to wait on that. 
because we just feel like it's not time. And as much as even he wants to have that, and he's agreed to wait, wow. we just know that something, how we can feel it, yeah. well, something is going to happen. Well, so, just with getting the VA stuff fixed, that was that was a, a crazy miracle. We were and that place where the tire exploded, mm -hmm. we were, it was horrible service. They they told us their stuff was fixed, that they ordered the parts to come on in, and we were stuck at 100 plus degree weather in a garage, no electricity, no water, no storage. Me and my wife, our four kids, and our two dogs. And, you know, I had to do school work, so we found the, the nearest public library, and I'm in there with my oldest son, because he he's in seminary as well. So we're doing our school work, and I come outside and my wife's talking to somebody. Apparently this woman walked up to my wife and was like, the Lord told me to talk to somebody today. You're that person. And you know, at first you have those reservations like, okay, really? And then the woman told my wife, she was like, my husband's a veteran. We fought for years to fight our VA case. And this attorney helped my family turn it around and gave my wife the attorney's card. And she didn't know I was a veteran. She didn't know nothing. It was one of those God moments. So then my wife well, it was, was almost scary. It wasn't even a God moment. It was scary. When I got into the car, I couldn't even talk because I felt like, like someone was watching me. Mm. This strange woman <laughs> came up to me and she said she lived about an hour away. She brought her granddaughter to the park and she said that God told her she had to come there. And she said, it's you. That's how she came up to me. She sat beside me on the bench. She said, it's you. And I'm like, what? And so as she tells me and gives me the number, I'm not calling this number. Well, my husband finally said, they told us the RV's gonna take another week to get fixed. So we're stuck in this parking lot. And finally he's like, maybe it's not gonna get fixed until we call the guy. So um, the guy met up with that, us that day. We got back at five o'clock as the RV park was closing and they already were like having everything ready for us to hitch and go. So the moment we talked to that attorney, the moment we got back, they said it was going to be a week. We were out of there within 15 minutes. So we knew, okay, like I said, there's a point when you're like, okay, maybe this is not by chance. Well, now it's not even been six months since that happened. And our VA case, we've been fighting for four years, has been closed. We won our case. The big thing was my medical. I lost medical. The day I was diagnosed with lupus, they said we made three dollars too much, and I lost my medical. Yeah. So I was diagnosed with lupus. I lost my legs for three months. It causes osteoporosis for me. So we're fighting to get it so we can get my medical back to make sure that nothing's happening with like organs and stuff. Yeah. So for since December 2014, I've not had medical. Well, now I have medical, like, and it all happened within six months. Our tire had to blow to put us in this place, mm -hmm. meet this woman who scared me, <laughs> but it was a test of faith. Yeah. And I, that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Our stories are so, they, your hair raises on your body, you know, mm -hmm. and you just, know, you know, you're on the right path. You know, you're doing the right thing. You know that it's, it's so, this is bigger than you can even imagine. Yeah, that's cool. That's a really, really big, I mean, really big testament to faith right there. And uh, that's a really cool story. So I'm glad you shared that. Thanks for <laughs> stepping over here in the in the camera view and sharing that yeah. story. So <laughs> um, we are going to wrap up, though. So I know you each have a couple of accounts on Instagram. Do you guys have a YouTube? I don't even know. Tell people where they can get in touch with you at. Um, well, our ministry website is www.walkingbyfaithmissions.com. That's um, whenever we receive donations and whatnot, it has a donation page. It has information about our ministry, what we believe in, what we do, how we do it. Um, my testimony is on my blog. Um, I have a really weird testimony. Uh, I grew up in a hospital of witch doctors, and then I was a high priest, and then my wife actually helped me find Christ. and. I have my testimony on my blog. That's uh, faithloveandroadschooling.com. And our Instagram is Walking by Faith Missions. My wife has hers, which is just a girl chasing her dreams. And our children's um, Instagram that we manage is Road Schooling Adventures. 
Um, it's just a lot of people have questions about, well, how do you educate your kids as you go? You know, what do you do? What do they do? Do they enjoy traveling? And our kids, we threaten our kids when they misbehave, we're buying a house. And they just start breaking down crying. They're like, no! Because they love this life so much. And a lot of people, they have questions about children socializing while, while road schooling. And our kids are some of the most social butterflies in the world. We teach them to talk to adults. They, we teach, they meet children along the journey 24-7. You know, they make friends in every museum, state, national park. They're pen pals with people all around the United States. Um, so that's a, that's another aspect. My wife manages that. Just so that way people know. educate people of you. It's a different view I think others don't understand. So I started that page. I don't have a lot of them on my page. It's more photography. But on theirs, I try to make it just just for them so people can see more of what it's about right and their view <clears throat> yeah i mean we kind of get that just with homeschooling i mean and, and where we're at in texas and i think maybe it's our city or whatever but we have a lot of homeschooling families down here like our church that we're at i mean if you don't homeschool at our church you're kind of the outcast i mean not that we don't uh, you know embrace the you know we have lots of friends that are post school i have nothing wrong with that uh, or no problem with that, but it's just weird the amount of people that homeschool, particularly at our church, and so <clears throat> it's we get that too. People are like, well, aren't they socialized, or they just don't know how to talk to you know? And I'm like, my kid will just walk up and talk to anybody and strike up a conversation. Like it's not a problem for them, you know. And and you know we do those same things where we try to teach you know respect toward adults and. You know, if, if adults are having a conversation, don't interrupt them. I mean, you know, just different things that, you know, uh, I feel like really need to be taught to our kids, you know. And, of course, everybody has their own, you know, opinion on things like that. But, um, but yeah, no, I totally agree with you on that. And I don't think that by any means there's a, um, a kids being homeschooled or road schooled or are less socialized. That just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So, um all right, so there's y'all's accounts. I'll link all those down below so people can get in touch with you. Um, and you guys really need to jump on YouTube if you're not on there. So <laughs> I think uh, I think people would like hearing your story and seeing your story. Hey, you need to talk to my wife. She totally had no, wanted nothing to do with a camera. Um, like I told him, she started doing it in her closet and just you know keeping the videos private. And then it was a way for her to deal with like you know hearing herself and seeing herself. And she really enjoys it now. So. Anyways. Instagram is like as far as I go and talk and I didn't even talk to people until two years ago on there I was very no one even knew I had kids or anything I was very yeah. Uh, basic yeah. so I'm just now it's a process <laughs> well people, people need to hear your story I mean you guys have a cool story you really do so well thank you well, I appreciate the time you had for, with us today. Sure, you too. All right, well, we'll wrap up. Um, thanks for being here. I appreciate you guys. Okay, bye. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that interview. Uh, I plan to do some more like this. If you liked it, be sure to subscribe and make sure you follow them because they've got some really cool stuff on their Instagram channels. And obviously, um, they have a real heart for uh, following the Lord and doing mission work. So, uh, be sure to reach out to them, let them know that you saw this and that you uh, really are inspired by their journey because um, I just think they're really incredible people and um, I look forward to finding out more about them. Thanks for being here.